Our next speaker today is Andrzej Krzemieński, who is a, I must say, veteran of Code Dive because we've had him here since the very first edition that happened. So he's here for the fourth time. He works with C++ mostly on very serious systems that include life critical and high performance systems. He's an active contributor to the C++ standard and also maintains one of the boost libraries. He has a famous blog. If you don't know that blog, it's easy to Google it and find out. And today he's going to tell us about undefined behavior. Let's welcome Andrzej Krzemieński. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for choosing this talk. You had a choice, right? Or <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm happy to be here, stressed out a bit also. I'm also grateful to the organizers for letting this happen. This is a lot of work. And today, uh, for the next 89 minutes, I'm going to talk about the undefined behavior. We had good talks, two of them, of undefined behavior last year, but none of them touched on the subject that I find most interesting. And this is how UB can help make your programs safer, and more correct. So in this talk, we're going to see some examples of uh, useful optimizations uh, based on UB, on some scary optimizations based on UB. We'll see how UB can help detect bugs in your program. And we we'll also see how it can ruin your program. But I think the last one doesn't really need to be shown. So first, what is uh, undefined behavior? It is not a crush, although it, in many minds it is associated with it. And uh, let's look, if I manage to do it, uh, at the example. This is a canonical example of uh, undefined behavior. I am creating a pointer that explicitly points to no valid memory, and then I'm trying to dereference it. Uh, according to the C++ standard, which is a contract between guys who write compilers and who use the compilers, it tells you nothing what happens uh, in this case. But something will happen when we compile it. When I compile it and run it, it runs fine. It does not crash. It produces value 32. Now, you may find it surprising. You may think you know why this happens, because you know, zero is maybe not a valid memory, but something is under this address. Maybe I can read it, maybe, well, not maybe, something will be there. So maybe this is this something that has got, uh, got returned. But this is not the case. In order to understand what this program does, we would have to peek into the assembly code generated by this, uh, from this program, and it looks like this. Just return whatever th uh, was there in the registry. and. Uh, this is no surprise. The compiler is allowed to do that. It did it for a purpose. You may know why. And there was no crash. But uh, uh, why do I start from convincing you that UB is not a crash? This is because it is so often, right? Our applications crash. Mine does. <laughs> And wh when it does, and you have to debug the problem, you, you would usually arrive at the code like this, or, or, or different UB, and uh, somehow it is uh, connected to crash, but only somehow. And this is first uh, important uh, characteristic of undefined behavior. When you hit it, you are guaranteed nothing, literally nothing, not even a crash, which, which you might uh, expect. And there is uh, another way of looking at it. From the compiler point of view, the compiler can assume that undefined behavior in your program never happens. And based on this assumption, it can draw conclusions, it can perform transformations to the code and optimizations. And to illustrate bo both of these aspects uh, in one example, I have a function main that creates some variable result with initial value 0. Then it has a array and fills it in, and then it returns this result, which is obviously 0, because we are not modifying it, in between. Then function fill 
does fill the array with uh, consecutive uh, integers. But I have uh, an undefined behavior here. I am indexing one element too much. It, it was supposed to be i less than 10, it's i less than equal 10. I made a typo. Uh, and we have uh, undefined behavior. If we compile this code, I compiled it with uh, GCC, with all optimizations disabled, it runs fine, it doesn't crash, it returns 10. <laughs> and to understand why, the reason it's doing that, it's because of how memory is slid out the, the, the mo memory uh, required for this result is allocated just after the array. So, uh, so this hypothetical 11th element that is not there and I'm indexing is actually the address of this variable result. And I am overriding it. So although you wouldn't expect that it's counterintuitive, from inside this function field you are able to change uh, to, to change the value of the variables outside. If you didn't expect that, that's fine, because y we wouldn't get there if I didn't make an undefined behavior in my code. But now what happens if I compile the same code with uh, all optimizations enabled? Now the code doesn't change, the memory layout doesn't change, but my result is now zero as I initially expected. Although, there is still the same function, it still accesses the 11th element. The uh, addresses work the same way, except that with all optimizations enabled, compiler is allowed to assume that UB never happens. If it never happens, it is never possible uh, for this uh, variable result to be, uh, to be changed. Compiler knows that now, and it is able to compile the entire program to just this, which means uh, set value zero in the return registry and return it. That's all. The rest of the code is irrelevant. It would only be uh, relevant if we have UB, but the compiler assumed legally that UB never happens. Compiler can assume that UB never happens, even if it does. And it has uh, strange consequences, as we'll see later on. And there is a third uh, property which we have to bear in mind as we go through the examples. First, there is this uninteresting part or uh, type of UB. Like I call it static UB. When you declare some name uh, in namesp namespace STD, it's undefined behavior, you shouldn't do it, but there's nothing interesting about it. Similarly, if you declare a global that starts with an underscore, it's UB. I'm not even sure why it's UB. It should be a hard error if, if it makes any problems will not deal with it anymore, we'll deal with something that I would call a runtime undefined behavior, which is the property of the execution of the program rather than the source code itself. Like here, we have a function that takes a pointer and dereferences it. And one important thing to uh, observe here is that this is not undefined behavior. This code has some potential to invoke uh, undefined behavior, but it is not undefined behavior itself, because it's possible that all the places in the program that use this function always give me a non-null pointer, which is fine, and there is no UB in the program. Here is a bit different situation. I, I have a pointer that is always null, that, uh, that's unquestionable, but I will only uh, read from uh, under it when does this uh, condition B is true? There is no undefined behavior here. Because it's possible that each time this function is executed, it's executed, uh, it's called with value false. So we have no UB, maybe only the potential for creating UB. And similarly here, I have, I'm explicitly creating null pointer, there is no condition, I'm always dereferencing it, but this is not UB yet because it's possible that this function is never used. So we get UB only when the execution of the program executes a given instruction with a special unwanted uh, value, and only then. The code is fine, it's just the execution that is wrong. So with this in mind, we can see some optimizations enabled by uh, undefined behavior. 
I have a very simple function, perhaps even too simple, but I, I need to fit it in into this slide. I'm dividing a number by, I'm first multiplying number by two and then dividing it by two. Well, I have two overloads, one taking a signed integer, other taking the unsigned integer. The obvious difference between signed and unsigned is, uh, is that the latter doesn't have negative numbers. But there is another difference, which is, I think, even more important, and not always realized, that when you overflow some operation on a signed integer, you get undefined behavior. The standard doesn't specify what happens. If you overflow on unsigned integer, you get this wraparound arithmetic, or some call it a modulo arithmetic. We start from zero, we just cancel off the, the, the some part and, and uh, wrap around. This has serious consequences on how uh, the code generated fro from this source looks like. This is what it is compiled to. In case of integer, the compiler is allowed to assume that uh, uh, UB never happens. It means that overflow never happens because it would be a UB. If it ruled out this case, what we are left with I is just returning the input. And this is what this code really does. It says take the input and return it uh, as output. In case of unsigned integer, the compiler cannot uh, do this assumption. It has to perform computation because it's possible that when multiplying i uh, by 2, it overflows. So it has to perform a wraparound, check the value, and only then divide it by 2. And it still optimizes something, so it, this code is shorter. It just removes the most significant bit. But nonetheless, it's longer than the one with uh, signed integer. Only because we can assume uh, no overflow. And you see, there is no risk of really overflowing anything in this example, because this is a no-op, actually, and the compiler knows that. And here, you probably also meant a non-op, but because of the rules of the guarantees that this wraps around, that it's always defined, it cannot apply. And it's not only about performance, it's also about the common sense. With this UB on overflow in mind, the type int resembles mathematical integers more. Like did you know that when you m multiply uh, big enough, uh, I fabricated this number so that it proves my point. Uh, of course, if you multiply it by 2 and divide it by 2, we know that it's the same number always for anything, but because of the rules, how it works for unsigned integers, you arrive at value 0. Only because we have to guarantee something on overflow, we get into less intuitive results. Because it's almost never that I found anyone needing this uh, modulo arithmetic when using uh, signed integers. Another example. Is i plus 1 greater than i? I it's an obvious truth. And for uh, ints, the compiler knows that. It doesn't even check the, the initial value. It will just return true. In case of unsigned integer, we don't know. Maybe i plus 1 overflows. We have to check it. You see, there is a condition here. The program is just longer, even though this is an obvious truth. And another example. Is uh, i plus 1 greater than 10? We know from mathematics that we can transform this uh, equation into a simpler one, and the compiler also knows it. You see, it, it knows that it has to compare against 9. In case of unsigned, it cannot do it. You know why. And there is more optimizations. Those fit into the slides. The other, uh, the, the other don't. But if you are using int as an index, it knows that a, the compiler knows that a plus i, and a, uh, I mean ai, ai plus 1, ai plus 2, are consecutive locations. B uh, because the, uh, the uh, ub never happens, it never wraps around, it m it mu they must be consecutive locations. Then it can apply some vectorization when compiling, it can fetch all three at one go because it knows they are adjacent. The generated code is faster, only because th there is an ub on overflow and UB never happens, according to the compiler. These optimizations ha have been there for decades, and they are quite intuitive and uncontroversial. 
but uh, the nowadays compilers can do far more. Let's go the other way. This is the example we've seen on, on last year's code dive on uh, Piotr's uh, presentation. I have an array of four elements, and I have a function that looks for a given value in this array. If it finds it, I, it returns true. If it doesn't, it returns false. But I have undefined behavior here. I'm indexing one element too much. From the point of view of the compiler, it looks like this. Either I have found it here and I, uh, in one of the four elements and I return true, or I have undefined behavior. Since undefined behavior never happens, it means that I always return true, and the compiler can optimize this entire code to this. And when I test it with the newest version of GCC, it really does it. And this is spectacular on one way, but on the other, uh, what did the compiler do? It, it optimized my buggy slow code into a buggy fast code. That's never, uh, you know, that was never my intention. What I would rather expect of the compiler, if it can see all, the, all, those, uh, all those things, which I didn't see, apparently, I would rather that it would give me a warning, so that I, I would rather fix my program than have it optimized. And it interestingly enough, when I run it against the static analyzer from Clang, or when I compile it with uh, UB sanitizers, they are not able to detect it. The compiler is able to optimize thi this bug, but it's not able to detect it. And there is something really wrong and scary about it. But the next example is even more scarier. I have a function that deals with a pointer. I have a defensive uh, if. If this pointer is null, I'm not going to call this because it's uh, undefined behavior. But here, I forgot. Obviously, in real code, this is longer. Yes, there's multiple lines between them, so it's not that obvious. I like finding code like this because I know how to make it better. For instance, if this function was used in production for 10 years and it never exposed any problems, it means that this function is never passed a null pointer because we would have problems otherwise. So I can change it to something like this, which is just faster and cleaner. You may be uneasy about me just letting null pointers like this, so this may be a good idea to address it somehow, like using this GSL non-null or whatever way, but it has to be systematic. You don't fix this problem by putting random defensive ifs at random places. But that's not the point I want to make. The point is the clever compiler can do exactly the same. It observes that if this function is past a null pointer, it would be undefined behavior. Since undefined behavior never happens, this check is redundant, and the compiler compiles it to this. But now, when I do it, it's OK. I can see the bigger picture. I can respond the, in a proper way. When compiler does it behind my back, he won't be th that good as me. Something, something bad is, you know, imminent. But it's getting even worse. Suppose that uh, my program starts to crash on production and I'm starting to suspect that something may be wrong around this function f. So I'm adding some logging statements just to check after it crashed at what point it was, more or less, so that I can, you know, dissect the problem into smaller ones. But the compiler still optimizes. Yeah, it sees that if this function f is called with a null pointer, it would be ub. Ub never happens, so this check is redundant. It just gets eliminated. And now I will look for my bug forever. Luckily, in this case, the static Clang static analyzer is able to find all those places and alert me rather than optimize for me. And this problem can really fool uh, word class experts. I, I don't know if you know the safe numerics library recently uh, accepted into Boost. It's not shipping with Boost yet, but it will soon. And you have this safe int. This is a replacement for int. It works almost the same, except that when you overflow, you, get a, you are guaranteed to get an exception. So you either get a mathematically correct result when you're adding numbers, or you get an exception. 
And this is how the, because the question is how you implement it. And the first initial implementation of this, uh, of such addition, went like this. First, uh, we perform the addition, and then we check what happens. A, assuming that B was positive, and the result is less than A, it means we must have wrapped around. So we are throwing an exception. And the same goes here. If B is negative, but the result is greater than initial A, A it means we must have wrapped around the other way. We are throwing an exception. If we filter out all the bad cases, we just return the value. And I complained to the author saying that, but you have undefined behavior like uh, right here. And he says, yeah, technically yes, but that doesn't matter because on all compilers that I care about and all that I tested, overflowing on, uh, on a sign integer means wrap around, exactly what I need. And he's probably right, I didn't check it. Maybe he's right about this, but that doesn't really matter because you will never get to the level of executing this code on your machine because the compiler still thinks. Yeah? If B is positive and this result is less than zero, it must have been undefined behavior. Since undefined behavior never happens, and the sole purpose of having this function is compromised. Luckily, well in, the, in the newer version, this is fixed. You don't have this problem anymore. But you can see how easy it is to get into this mind trap. Another clever check that people, somebody do. If you detect that something dangerous is happening in your program, like perhaps it's uh, illegal access or whatever, you just perform invalid read from memory on purpose because you know the, uh, uh, the system will kill your program and that's what you want. You want to kill the program. But this is undefined behavior. Undefined behavior never happens. This condition is never true. This check is gone. So this is about uh, uh, the dangerous optimizations, but dangerous are as they are, UB is still useful and to such extent that compilers like GCC or Clang will give you keywords only to trigger undefined behavior, like this built-in unreachable here. Its semantics is when control reaches the, the, this line, the behavior is undefined. But this is exactly what I know uh, the compiler, what I want the compiler to know. Because I have this function, which if some A is not zero, it returns B. Otherwise, it throws an exception, but I know that it throws an exception because I can read the name. The compiler doesn't know what this function does. And it, it gives me a warning that th this function may not be returning any, val uh, any value, which is undefined behavior. So I'm telling the compiler, hey, you will never reach there, trust me. It trusts me. Yeah, it assumes that apparently this function either throws or, or calls exit or abort or performs an infinite loop. Y y you will never uh, get there. Now that the compiler knows it, the, the warning is silent, the code may be generated faster, and there's nothing wrong with it. This is another application of, of, of this uh, built-in unreachable. I can implement an assertion-like macro with it. It says, if this condition is false, undefined behavior. And uh, to the compiler, we treat it the other way around, it means uh, this, con uh, this, is, this would be UB, so it never happens, so this condition is always true, and I can use it uh, for further optimizations in the code. Of course, we know the dangers of dealing with undefined behavior, so uh, normally what uh, people do is to define it conditionally. In test builds, we are just performing normal asserts, so we are making a defensive check and alerting the programmer if something is wrong. In super-optimized builds, we give additional hint to the compiler. So this is about optimizations. Now to static analysis. But first we have to understand how uh, static analysis works, more or less. So I have a simple program. I will be reading uh, names from some file, which I will refer to by this file name, and I will be returning the, the name through this pointer, which is initially no. So first I'm parsing the contents of the file, to some some collection of names, and then in these names, uh, I look for the best match. 
but my program will never do that because I have a typo here. I co uh, confuse the names of the variables, and now it will do something different. And I will never. And worse still, to the compiler, this program looks fine because they both have the same type. It will compile and do something, uh, and compiler cannot uh, do anything about it, or not. In fact, it can do something about it, because we have all these warnings in the compiler, which actually perform some limited static analysis. Like one of the warnings, each warning enables some, uh, some check, and one of those is looking for uh, names that were declared and never used afterwards which is something fishy. Yes? When you do it, it's really something suspicious. Why would you create a variable bother with initializing it when you're not using it? And the compiler warns me about it. It doesn't know what my problem is. It doesn't know that I have a bug, that I confused the uh, names of the variables, but it has found something else, something fishy, and this is enough for me to react. But I may have a bad luck, and I may be using this, uh, this uh, variable for something else. Now, the compiler, at least this warning, cannot uh, warn me anymore, because to the compiler it's all fine. It doesn't see bugs, it only sees fishy things. And there is no fishy thing. And actually, there is one fishy thing, because as we said, I'm passing null pointer here, and the tools are very good at uh, tracking what happens with uh, null pointers be being used illegally. So maybe I have a chance for the compiler to find the bug for me because I have this null pointer. But we don't know it from here. It all, it all depends on how this uh, parse file is using this pointer. So let's check it. Well, I wrote it so I know what it does. I have my custom implementation of a string. It takes argument by this string. For the record, I don't recommend writing your own string class, especially not like that because it, it has uh, lots of problems in it, but it only serves to illustrate my point. W I have a converting constructor taking a pointer, and then I just dereference it. I, don't I, don't I never check. I assume that you never pass me null pointer. I assume that it's a really array of characters, and I trust you on that. If you give me a null pointer, you get undefined behavior. So. What happens? We are lucky. In this, this is the first time you get a uh, you get a, uh, the referencing uh, null pointer, and you are lucky, and you are happy about it. If I compile this code, I don't get any any warning because looking for these things takes time, and the compilers need to be fast, so, th so they they don't do all possible static analysis that I would like. But when I uh, run a Clang static analyzer against this code. I immediately uh, get warned. It tells me I'm uh, the referencing uh, null pointer. It will give me all the relevant places where, where I need to check. Again, it doesn't know what my problem is, but it has found some fishy thing. Yeah, I probably never wanted to dereference a null pointer, and this is enough for me to respond. But what if my implementation of string was more you know, cautious? Now, uh, now, in the converting constructor, I have a defensive if check because I don't want uh, uh, you know, the referencing of the UB to spoil my program. I pr I'm protecting at runtime against undefined behavior, and that's probably good, but that's also bad because now my static analysis is compromised. Because to the compiler, the code looks fine. Maybe I passed a null pointer only because I wanted to uh, throw an exception. It's good to throw exceptions. That's what they are for. There is nothing wrong with it, nothing incorrect about it. The uh, static analyzer is required to keep silent, even though the bug is still there. So by, uh, or by only, uh, let's go back to this, by only having been prepared for the runtime UB, I have compromised static analysis. And the next interesting question is, what happens if this function parse was using a standard string? If we go to, to, to check what the standard says, it says that the converting constructor uh, requires 
the calling the, uh, the constructor requires that this s, th th this pointer, points to an array. Null pointer doesn't point to the array, and according to how the standard is defined, if you don't meet these requirements, it is undefined what happens. We get undefined behavior. So if I test it with, uh, the with a standard string, no, it doesn't work. I get uh, not that bad because I was informed about the problem, it was aborted because an exception was thrown, and I didn't expect one. But why, why was uh, an exception thrown then? If we look into the implementation of the string in the standard library on my GCC, a part of other things, the first thing I it does is a defensive check. But now, it was supposed to be UB. So why are they performing a uh, defensive check? And this is because they can. Because we go back to the guarantees. You, are expecting, uh, you cannot expect anything when you hit UB, not even a report from the static analyzer. And on the other hand, a library vendor can assume that UB never happens in your code, so you shouldn't care what happens in this case because you are not supposed to get there. So he has uh, liberty to do anything uh, they want, and they have chosen something quite reasonable to protect against UB at runtime. But they have compromised my static analysis. And, and this is uh, one thing worth remembering. When you protect against uh, UB at runtime, you are compromising uh, the static analyzer. It cannot uh, do its job properly. Maybe it's better to use uh, UB sanitizers. You know, the compilers like GCC or Clang come with these UB sanitizers, which actually do the same. They, they are just injecting runtime defensive checks in all the places where UB would, not in all, as we've seen in other examples, but in a lot of uh, cases where otherwise we would get an undefined behavior. But they do it not at the source code level, so the static analyzer cannot see it, and it can see the bug, but they are injecting defensive checks when w into the compiled code. So you get the best of both worlds when you use them instead, if you can. But, oh, and one interesting thing here is that, of course, I simplified the implementation from the standard because it's a uh, hell of a read, but I left the original comment I, 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 uh, unchanged. It says, not required, but considered the best practice. I would question that statement. It's not really best because, for one, it compromises static analysis. Maybe it would be better to, to put it conditionally, like with this hash if devs. If you are generating a real code, yes, go with the defensive check. But if you are performing static analysis, pretend that this check is not there so that the static analyzer can work. But there is another way to respond to undefined behavior, which is even more <laughs> funny. If I get the uh, wrong argument, let me fix it myself. Let's just pretend then that you actually meant some default value. Read me TXT, it's you know, reasonable default, or easy. And then, some people do it, then my bug is still there, yes? It no nothing changed here, except that now static analyzer cannot work at all because there is no, no bug here. Maybe I wanted to use the default. Runtime, no runtime checks will be performed be because you, you don't even get an exception. This program will run and do something, but something else than you expected, and it's only the users that will tell you that. This is a summary of this. The attempts to fix the argument at runtime locally, where you don't know the context, are just futile. You are compromising all the, all the, all the job that the tools can do for you, both the static one, uh, analysis and, and uh, runtime checks. And I shouldn't be even telling you this if, what, if it was not for the fact that some guys at the standards committee really considered doing this at some point for the string view. In C++17, we'll get this uh, string view, which is a cheap way uh, of passing strings in different forms by reference. I mean, you, you take this by, by value, but inside it's just a pointer, so you're actually passing 
by uh, reference both uh, pointers to arrays, and you get it for free without any allocation, unlike with string references. And you can pass it passes just string, and I again, it works out of the box without any memory allocation. So it's a fast way of passing any type of string. You may be using it already because it's already provided in Boost and in experimental headers of uh, most of the compilers. And because it, the, the string view actually holds a pointer to the array of characters and the size, you can also observe a substring of, of something. If you want to only see the first part, it works. You just give me the pointer, the size, and it works. And in particular, it works for this fishy case where, where the size is zero. You may think it's useless, but in fact, this uh, string view also works for vectors of characters. I if you want to use it with vector, you just give me a pointer to the array that's underneath the vector. We know that there is one, the size, and it should work. But vectors are sometimes default constructed, and default constructor of a vector wants to be fast. If it's fast, it fast, it doesn't allocate an any memory. So where does this array point to? It is a null pointer. But that's OK. If the size is 0, we know what to do. You meant, you meant a, a zero-sized uh, uh, literal. It's fine. But because all this is fine, the guy started to wonder, what happens if you just pass me a null pointer? Now, passing a null pointer to, uh, to a string view uh, really doesn't make sense. If you do it, you, it's probably due to a bug like mine, a bug. But some of the guys thought like this. Since we know what to do for, the, uh, for a vector with a null pointer and zero size, why not pretend that when you pass us a null pointer, you actually meant a vector and a zero size? And what they do with it is, is uh, the same as we've seen in other slides. They're just trying to fix arg the, the value of the argument for you rather than fixing the program where you probably have a bug. This way the bug would be concealed and, and uh, it would only be the users that would tell you that something is wrong with your program. Luckily, they made the uh, right choice and this is an undefined behavior. And this way, when you ever use the string view and pass it a null pointer by accident, you will get first the static analyzer to help you. Then, if it's implemented with a defensive check, you will get an exception. You will be let known that something is wrong with your code. It will not go you know, silently. This is another takeaway from this. Functions uh, with a narrow contract, like most of them we've seen so far. Not every argument works for this function, like null pointers don't work for some functions. We say the, the function has a narrow contract, so that you have to be careful what, what argument to give us. Some people are afraid of functions with narrow contracts because, you know, it's UB and UB is crash and it's bad. But narrow contract is not a crash. It has certain potential to cause crashes, but only when you have some bug around. In other ways, it, it gives you a symptom and this is what UB is. It is a symptom of a bug you have in your program. If you are artificially changing narrow contracts to white contracts by these defensive ifs, you are removing the symptoms, you are curing the symptoms, but you are not curing the disease. And now the disease is more difficult to find because you have no clues. Let's see how it works by an example. I have a function that that will uh, initialize, that will compute some, val some uh, value of int. I mean, this is not a nice way of doing it, but I'm confined to this library, third-party library, which requires the object to exist before I can fill the value in it. So I'm first creating the object, I'm not assigning initial value, and then based on different conditions, I use a different algorithm of uh, computing the value. So if C1 is true, this is fill one. If C1 is false, but C2 is true, it's another value. And if C1 is false and C2, and I have a bug here because it was supposed to be bank C2. Well, I made a typo. So there is a, w uh, there is a chance that I may be returning a uninitialized integer. And the compiler, when I enable warnings, and I do, and you also do it, right? <laughs> you should. 
it immediately sees this problem and alerts me. And then I have a developer who sees this problem. I mean, he sees the bug report and then something is used, uninitialized, it is bad. So he comes and types this. And now the, the value is always initialized. There is no warning. He's calm. He can go home. But what he did was to cure the symptom. The bug is still there, except that now you cannot see it anymore. Also, if you imagine a different language than C++ that does this, when you forget to initialize, we just fill zero for you, this bug would never have been found. Right? This is what I like C++ for, that so many bugs Real bugs are detected at compile time. It's not even because of the type system, only because I have, it's not even undefined behavior, it's unspecified behavior. So it's guaranteed that something will be returned. It, you just don't know what. But only because it has this, you have more chances of finding your bug. It would not work if I, uh, if I was initializing a string now, because string, w w which is left alone like this, does initialize inside, because it has a, a default constructor. So what I would like to have, now I'm talking, I'm fantasizing about the future, you, do, you don't have it, but, but uh, I, I would at least like to have it, is to have the attribute like uninitialized, which means yeah, for the purpose of generating code, go, go with the default constructor, but for the purpose of performing static analysis, let's pretend it's uninitialized and give me the warnings. This would find even more warnings, and maybe one day we have something like this uh, in the standard. If we did, I would even e use it for integers. Like, okay, there is some little merit in providing initial uh, value, because now the bug that is still there is repeatable. It's, it's the same bug each, each time I execute this code. So uh, there, there is some marginal merit in doing this, but I would still use this attribute uninitialized to mean, yes, for runtime, uh, go with the default value. For, for the purpose of static analysis, pretend that it's initialized, give me warnings where appropriate. And now I'm going to uh, share with you some experiment uh, uh, that I did. I'm writing my own function for computing the square root. It's going to be a template, so this t is nothing specific. It's only something that, is, that works like a real number. Because it's real number, it doesn't make sense to pass me negative numbers. I have an explicit precondition. You, you better not pass me negative numbers. And I will use the implementation known as the Newton iteration. So I it's, uh, I'm doing it in a loop. In each loop I'm computing the next approximation of the result. I'm also keeping track in this brief while on, on of the previous uh, approximation from the previous iteration. And they converge. And when they are close enough, I return this value. And it works. It's not the ideal way of implementing square root. It's not the fastest, but it makes sense. It's uh, correct and it illustrates a couple of interesting points. Because what happens if you give me a negative number there? There is no undefined behavior here, but th the way this algorithm was constructed, when you give me a negative number, this, this algorithm will never converge. It will just compute random numbers, uh, positive, negatives. It will go on end. And and this uh, this loop will never terminate. And this uh, this proves some points that people make, like some people say that you shouldn't care that much about people giving you rubbish inputs inputs because they they will just get rubbish output in return. This will this is not going to be the case here because. They will not get rubbish output. They will get nothing. Th this, this function will just go on end. It will be only after two days that you realize that, that you have a bug if you are performing a long uh, computation. Also, some people have suggested that you shouldn't be uh, declaring your preconditions explicitly because a good tool can infer and construct the precondition from only looking at the code. It's not going to happen here even th if the compiler can see all that because there is nothing wrong with this 
code that the tool could hook to, because th this is correct. Sometimes you do want to have infinite loop for processing some uh, messages in a message pump. Uh, infinite loop itself is nothing wrong, and apart from that, there is nothing, nothing fishy in this program. So the, no tool will be able to infer the precondition from this implementation. But so I have to, I want to somehow to indicate that I have a precondition here, and it has to be something more than just a comment. I definitely don't want to do it like this. First, in, in order not to compromise static analysis, which I need. And second, because I don't want to give specific guarantees to my users as to what happens then, because if I do, somebody sooner or later will start using my code like this. There is, uh, in order to check if, uh, if a number is negative, you just invoke a square root, and if it threw an exception, yes, it means it was negative, it doesn't throw, it's positive, people will start using code like this, and they do. Of course, not in the silly case like this, but I have often seen it in my programs. When I fix an obvious bug, I immediately break somebody else's code because they started to rely on my bug. Here, for instance, if I only check this throwing E to throwing something more specific, like precondition broken, I immediately spoil somebody else's implementation of is negative. And then uh, uh, the, the problems will just go on end. So I would n uh, rather not give any guarantees as to what happens to, to the users that call my function like this. I want my users to be afraid to pass me negative numbers. So here is the task uh, that, that I try to solve. Is there anything that I can put in here? Remember that this is a template. So uh, the property of a template is that usually you ship the body of the function inside a header file. So wherever it is used, the, com the tools, not necessarily the compiler, but the static analyzer, can see both the usages and the implementations. It has some bigger context. And I was wondering whether I can type some something here to give the static analyzer enough hints to warn me about whenever a negative number is passed to my function and keep silent when the usage is proper. I tried to go with the, I was just experimenting wi with the Clang static analyzer. I went with uh, assert, uh, assert, because it's a common way of, a, uh, cor whether correct or not, it is a common way of expressing preconditions I I in your programs. And although the static analyzer does recognize assert as something special, it uses it in the exact opposite, opposite way. It just trusts me on this. If I say x is greater or equal to zero, it just stops all analysis. I, it just works. This assumption works well for, for, uh, for it. it. It doesn't have to check anymore because it, you know, it has this certainty given by me. This is surprising maybe, but, but this decision has some merit because they chose that this, is, this will be the way of silencing false positives. If you run the crank static analyzer, it gives you, apart from genuine uh, uh, errors, it finds correct code and reports it as a bug. No tool is perfect. And assertions are a way of silencing false positives. So they will not work for my case. I tried to use this uh, built-in unreachable, the, the hack with the assertion we've seen before. It doesn't work either because uh, again, the uh, the even the static analyzer trusts me on this. If I say this never happens, this never happens. It doesn't have to analyze anymore, and it doesn't. Its job is faster, it works faster, but it, uh, it doesn't help my case. I learned there is another uh, special uh, keyword for undefined behavior in Clang, which does more explicitly w what I do with this built-in unreachable, this is built-in assume. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it instructs the compiler that it should assume that the condition holds, the Clang also assumes that it doesn't check anything anymore. It cannot help me. So I try to do it with a conventional way. I if this uh, value is uh, uh, negative, just perform invalid access to memory. Now I get warning, but definitely not the one that I expected. It says that null pointer uh, will not be deleted. Uh, I mean, the, the, the entire it says entire check will be deleted. I, it knows that I'm doing something fishy. It knows that it was not by mistake. It thinks that I wanted to crash the program, so it's giving me the hint. Better use built-in trap, because it works. I, it doesn't have these problems with disappearing I, I, if statement. But I didn't want that. 
it will not work for me because it, this, this, uh, this warning appears always, always, regardless of the number I, I pass. But there is a built-in trap. I tried this. It doesn't work also because although this program crashes at runtime, there's nothing wrong with it. Maybe I want to crash. Like maybe I want to call abort, exit. It's all fine. And uh, uh, requesting a system to terminate me, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing that the static analyzer can hook to. Finally, I reached out to Clang developers and they told me, one of them was kind enough to inform me that there is a hidden magical uh, word in Clang, like this Clang analyzer word, if unreached, which does exactly this. If I enable some, again, hidden, hidden checker that is not even enabled by default, this debug exp inspection, if this code is ever detected to be reached, I get a warning, the one, th th the one that I wanted. They say they don't uh, even advertise it because it, gi it would give too much false positives and they don't want it. It would be a bad reputation for the static analyzer to, to give too much false positives. But I mean, I think my expectations are different. I would rather get too much false positives and then you know, disable them one by one in order to get a warning about the genuine bug that is there. Sometimes, the problems like this can be addressed with a type system. Like, m m what I could do is to not get T directly when I want a non-negative T, but uh, get it through a uh, template wrapper. This wrapper is nothing special. It just, it just offers you two conversions. One explicit conversion from T, the other explicit conversion back to T. The only thing I get is that when, when you pass me the, the T directly, it does not compile. So what you have to do is to use my square root function like this, which is a bit inconvenient. You can do it in C++17. You don't have to even pass the type. The constructor will deduce it. It is inconvenient because you have to type more, but the, it has a benefit that you will never pass me a negative number by accident. You will have to do it explicitly, and then you have at least just a chance to think wha what's going on here. And if, because non-negative is something common that we need quite often, if I get more of this, like absolute value always returns uh, non-negative numbers, if I propagate this template ar everywhere around, I can still get a concise syntax wi without any problem. But it only works for some cases. Like if I have a precondition that the number is greater than two, I will not be declaring a, a wrapper only for that purpose. And also sometimes a precondition is not uh, on a single value, but on a set of values. Like we have in the standard this uh, arctangent function. You can pass practically any value x works, any value y works, but some combination of them doesn't work. I mean, the, the purpose is to for this function is to you give me x, y co uh, Cartesian coordinates of a point, and I give you the one of the polar coordinates, the, the angle. So I I if you give me if x is zero, it means uh, a straight angle. I, uh, I know what you return you. If uh, y is zero, it means a zero angle. It's fine. If you give me two zeros, there is no angle to be s uh, talked of. Uh, uh, actually, it makes no sense. Y uh, I don't know what to do. It's a precondition. And how do I express that in a type system? There, uh, there is no way. And in fact, there is. In fact, I I in this case, because how often have you have to use function square root in, in, your, in your real life programs? Because the, the only place where I've seen square root used was to compute the distance between two points or to, or to convert from Cartesian to polar coordinates. And if, it, if this is the case for you, if the only purpose of you using square root is to convert from one coordinate system to the other, maybe you can go with a different abstraction like Cartesian chords and polar chords and just offer function to polar coordinates and then there is no uh, need for a precondition anymore. When we convert, we know that for 0, 0, the radius is 0, the, there is no talking about uh, angle anymore. We just return the special vari value 0, 0. And now, but now, this if is not defensive. It doesn't check for bugs in the program. It's part o of the, of the uh, algebra and part of the business domain. 
This is what the users want. If you look at any mathematical book, this is wha what you want to get. And if we rule out this case, I can just compute the uh, square root. And you can see I don't have to check anything because I know only from the structure of the expression if you multiply a number by itself, it's never negative. Two such numbers are never negative. I guarantee that precondition holds without checking anything at runtime. I just, I just know it from the structure o of my code. And similarly, here, here because I have ruled out the, the zero, 0 case, I just call it here. No precondition. The, the contract is wide of this function, and not because I have ar artificially within it, but because I have used a different abstraction that better suits, uh, better describes my problem. But of course, you cannot uh, fix any, uh, you, you cannot address any precondition like this. So sometimes you just have to express the precondition in your code, and there is no way to do it. But there may be in the future because in the standards, uh, people are actively working on a new feature called contracts, which serves exactly this purpose. I can express certain properties, for instance, of uh, inputs to my function. I use it with this attribute syntax. Expect means I'm declaring a precondition, and it says it's a legal C++ expression here, that x is greater or equal zero. The semantics, what does it mean, actually? I, it's, it's close to the semantics of undefined behavior. It means that if you don't respect that and give me any negative number, you are not guaranteed anything. You don't know what happens. Maybe there will be a defensive check, and we'll check it. Maybe not. You don't know. So you, so you better not do it. On the other hand, the author of the function, whoever writes the implementation, can just assume that you have respected this precondition. You will not be uh, inputting any, you will probably be not putting any defensive ifs. He has a liberty not to do it. He can trust you that, that whoever uses this function will do the, the right job, or if they don't, that some external tool will, uh, will inject defensive checks, but the author himself doesn't do anything. He just assumes that the precondition is met. And one important thing, better than my uh, poor man's solutions is that now this precondition is part of the function declaration. So even if this square root is not a template and is uh, compiled in another translation unit, it doesn't matter anymore because all the tool static analyzers can see what the precondition is only from the declaration. And it's like every tool can use it for any purpose. Like compilers can inject defensive checks if you configure them to do so. The static analyzer can warn you about false, uh, about bad usages of this. And, uh, this is quite elegant. Similarly, you can uh, express something that the function guarantees, like the, the post condition. Like function absolute value guarantees that the result wi will never be negative. I use a different special word, ensures, which means I'm talking about uh, what happens after the function exits without exception. I'm introducing new variable, uh, new name R to refer to the return value because the, the return value in the declaration has no name. So I will be calling it R and for this R I specify that the, the, the result, it will never be negative upon return. And if I have it, if we have it in the language at some point, uh, the tools uh, will be able to make use of it. Just to be sure, uh, there are two names of two features being worked on in the standards committee. One is called contracts, the other is concepts. They both start with con, but they are something different. So we should not confuse them. Contracts express constraints on values. And, and those are those attributes, whereas concepts you have probably heard of express constraint on types. And now if we, have, uh, if we had these contracts, uh, a program that looks like this, I, I'm just getting some input from the user, I'm, uh, I'm passing it to uh, square root, I would expect a good static analyzer to, to warn me immediately that I'm passing a raw value, you don't know nothing about it, it may be dangerous, Do uh, deal with it. And I can deal with it in a number of ways. For instance, I, I can check for the value and if it's wrong, uh, 
ask the user again, refuse to process his request, whatever. But if the, if the analyzer sees both the precondition and uh, my check, sorry, I wanted a laser. <laughs> it can draw a conclusion, it can silence the warning. Similarly, if I don't give it a, a raw value, but I process it through function uh, uh, absolute value, it can match the, the static analyzer can match the post condition of one function with the precondition of the other function. It can silence the, the, uh, uh, the warning. Because now there's nothing wrong with it, even though I'm pr performing no checks. If I multiply a number by itself and pass it to square root, would the tool be able to detect it? It probably depends on how this T is implemented, whether it's using this contracts itself or not. But even if it doesn't, I can always silence the fa false positive manually by, by additional tool for silencing false positives. But here we are talking about uh, uh, the future. So I may be convinced you that uh, UB is something good, but we should keep in mind that it is evil also, especially that the standard defines it in places where you would least expect them. Like here, I'm taking a forward list, which can only, you, you can only iterate forwards uh, in it. I'm taking a, it even, if I take the iterator, it doesn't even have this uh, decrement op uh, operator, because what for? If I pass it to function pref, because I want to compute the last element, one before the last, I call it to function pref, believe me or not, this is undefined behavior. And if I test it, uh, uh, like uh, I'm using GCC5, if I compile it with GCC5, it compiles fine, it runs, it crashes. And maybe it's, the, it's not that bad, because with other iterators I check it with, it will just go on end. But it is surprising, because so often wh when we pass bad types to the, to the, uh, uh, to the standard algorithm, you we will get a compiler error. And even though, the, even though if technically this is UB, I think uh, I would ask, how is it possible for GCC to even compile this code when it needs to function pref at some point needs to call the decrement operator and it's not there? How, how is it possible that it even compiles? Even though, even if they want it to be mean, it's just impossible. But it turns out that it is because uh, function pref does not do any decrement. It just expresses the, uh, the precondition. This way, in the standard library, you express formal preconditions. We require that the iterator is bidirectional. Our is not. You cannot move backwards. But we don't check it. We just forward it to function advance. We just make a copy, change the sign, so we'll be passing minus 1 to function advance. We just advance by, by minus 1. Done. What does function advance do? It does different things. It does the tag dispatching. It recognizes the type of the iterator, the kind of the iterator, and uses different implementations. Th those are the ones that we should be interested I in. If it's a random access iterator, you get the result immediately. If it's bidirectional iterator, but not random iterator, we'll get, get them uh, step by step. We'll be decrementing the decrementing because we are calling function pref with minus one. So we'll be decrementing it uh, as long as it takes, but we'll uh, get to the right result. But there is also this case of function advance. If you pass, you know, we know how to advance forward iterators, right? You just call, we just assume that the, this n uh, is not negative and go on and just increment. And this way, by w if we combine all this, when you call function pref with forward iterator, it just increments it rather than decrementing it. It doesn't make sense to call this, this thing from, uh, from function pref, but it's your fault, yes? It doesn't, I why, w why would you pass forward iterator to, uh, to function pref? It's your responsibility because it's UB. You have to take care of that. But uh, one other thing we can observe here is that the compiler is able to tell the kind of the iterator. Somehow it dispatches to different functions. So it has enough tools to determine the kind of the iterator. 
So why didn't it warn us here if it could? And the answer is quite simple, because it doesn't have to. Right? Because it's undefined behavior. We if, if we check it with Visual Studio, it has a static assert, it fails to compile. It it's just their goodwill to do it, because they, they don't have to. If you compile it wi with Clang, it has enable if tricks, uh, it will not compile. In case of GCC, because they don't have to, we get, we, we get a bug. And of course, nobody uh, creates a forward list and passes it to pref. Yeah? Th that would be really silly, but I was really hit by this problem when I was using a zip iterator from Boost. I don't know if you know how, to how the zip iterator works. It's you give me a tuple of iterators, like two, three, more iterators, and I give you one instead, w which, uh, which <laughs> contains all of this in, in one object. So when you are incrementing this zip iterator, you are actually incrementing each of these iterators you gave me at one go. And when you dereference the iterator, rather than getting any reference, you are getting a tuple of references, each reference pointing to the element in the corresponding container. Well, interesting as it is, you when I use it with vector iterators, wi which, you go which can iterate backwards, I get a, an iterator that also can go backwards, but because how the constraints are defined in the standard library today, an iterator that returns a proxy, and we are, we are really returning a proxy, cannot be anything more than just an input iterator. It's a formal static requirement on a forward iterator that it does not return a proxy. And it does, there is good reason to return a proxy, but because of that, it is only, a, uh, only an input iterator. And although you can, uh, it can decrement it with correct results uh, explicitly, when you, when you call it with function pref, it is recognized as input iterator, it dispatches wrong, and this time the application doesn't crash on vectors, it just goes on end. It iterates over the consecutive memory locations which are on the stack. This is, this is not fine, but the system cannot detect it, cannot kill the application, it just goes. And maybe, you know, uh, if, the, if the computation is long, it's after two days that you learn that you are not really performing any meaningful computation. Luckily, in the, uh, in the new, uh, new implementation of uh, ranges that is being currently worked on, and Eric Nibbler will tell you tomorrow, this uh, requirement that, you that, uh, that uh, forward iterators cannot return proxies is lifted. There is no th th this is no longer there, so this problem would have never occurred if I'm using this ranges B3 or the new ranges TS, which is being developed for the standard. And also, w once we have concepts, which is also a likely future for the C++, the, uh, the, f the, the syntactic requirements then have to be met. It's not a UB anymore, they, they will have to be checked by the compiler. So this, this uh, problem will go away when the compilers are forced to check all syntactic requirements uh, on the types. Even if the concept don't make it, for some reason, uh, uh, the folks at the standards committee are still working to fix this problem in the standard library, so that there are some hard requ um, static requirements which compilers must check statically. But for now, you may have a problem if you are working with uh, GCC. So uh, the only uh, recommendation I can uh, get is that when you are using version 6 or later, they have introduced this uh, additional macro, which performs more, more static checks, even I if you don't use concepts, because GCC 6 comes with concepts. If you, if you even if you don't want them, you can still enable this macro, get additional checks which, uh, which solve this problem and just turns the, the buggy code into a compiler error. And uh, that's it, basically. I was told to uh, give some advice at the end, so I, I will do it.
I did not want to put you off from uh, putting defensive checks because there, there is a merit in doing them, but it's worth remembering that they come with a cost. And I, I do not even mean the cost of you know, performing this check and, uh, and taking some time, but the cost of compromising static analysis. So for the mutual benefit, you, you might consider, if you insist on defensive checks, doing those hash if devs so that the at least the static analyzer can temporarily pretend that they are not there so that the static analysis can proceed proceed and you can also consider using ub sanitizers instead which also do some of the defensive checks but not at the source code level and uh, uh, of course the tools uh, can only detect bugs when you use them so the uh, obvious advice is to use uh, things like uh, uh, Clank Static Analyzer or Clank Tidy. Even if you are using GCC, which I do, for instance, you can still uh, use the run the Clank Static Analyzer or just Clank before, only to get more uh, feedback from static analysis. It's only enabling warnings helps. Only if you enable all warnings, and especially turn them into errors, uh, which I do, you will get uh, some feedback even from the compiler. And I don't even, I don't mean only this minus wall option, there are small warnings that the compiler can give you if you, if you uh, dig enough. And apart from static checks, we, we should remember that there are sanitizers with the compilers like uh, Clang or GCC, which then detects your bugs at runtime, but do it quite systematically. And I think that's it from me. Thank you for <laughs> staying with me till the end. If there is anything you want to ask, this is the right time or you can approach me later on. I, I will be hanging around here. We can actually now take some questions. So there are microphones available. Bartek has one, I have one. So if you raise your hand, you'll have the ability to ask the question. Hi. Um, so, f f first of all, great talk. So, um, in the beginning, you said that um, so with all optimizations disabled, uh, y your compiler, uh, well, let's say GCC, is not able to detect the undefined behavior. So, do you know uh, at what optimization level this uh, in the undefined behavior detector, let's say, kicks in? So, for example, let's say, will it be difference uh, if I will use O2 or O3? So, will some cases will be uh, undetected, for example, on O2 level? I mean, the compiler does not detect the bug from my initial slice in any optimization. It just it uh, optimizes based on it. If it detected the bug, maybe it would warn me. It just optimizes based on some UB knowledge. My pr practical uh, experience with it was that uh, with O0, it just goes the hard way. It just compiles the, the entire code with O2, I, I'm not even sure why I never use O3 with O2. The, this was uh, exper experimented with O2. And then you, know, th you get this additional uh, optimization. I suspect that sometimes compiler is not aware explicitly that the bug happens. Uh, we've seen other optimizations that it just, I don't even know how to say it. It, it just knows that certain transformation can be uh, performed and doesn't really have to check whether the UB would really happen or not. Uh, I'm not sure if, if it <laughs> answers uh, your question. Well, yeah, okay, Go with O2, you will get the <laughs> you will get these uh, optimizations based on UB. We have another question over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that there are these these two fundamental ways that that you can interpret UB if it happens in your program. The the one being that. Um, okay, like this will never happen, so I'm, I'm just going to pretend during code generation that it doesn't occur and then might be able to optimize. And the other being this, this static, analysi static analysis view of saying this was not supposed to happen, so you probably made a bug. Um, and I guess the, the standard doesn't dictate which way it goes, right? That, that, that was your, your problem, why you couldn't make it happen when you actually wanted it for the static analysis. Um, is now with uh, with contracts uh, being like on on the doorstep, um, is 
is it any different there? Like, does the standard actually say what the intention is when, when you write a contract, what you wanted to express, or is it still as ambiguous um, as it was with the, the undefined behavior before? I think it is. I do not have access to discussions directly, what's going in the standards committee, but mm, judging from the, the output I get, I think there is some controversy around what is you know, guaranteed for sure and what is left as freedom. I think the goal is to allow both optimizations based on UB, so this assumption that it never happens, and, and, uh, and guarantee both uh, you know, also the explicit checks, which means in, fi in total that you are guaranteed nothing again. Okay, so, so it's like we're, we're going to have our, our cake and, and eat it too, right? So we, we get both, both good things at the, at the same time with contracts. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's the way of looking at it. Although I know uh, taking the other people see it as, as something bad, that there is l this option left for invoking some function with the pre predicate uh, not met. While yeah, some consider it a good thing for optimization, I think others would, would call it, a, even, uh, even because only you leave this option, there is, there is something mm, bad about it. Okay, thanks. Do we have any other questions? Mm, great talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, what do you think about using assets, uh, which are disabled at uh, release builds? Where should we use them? No, I mean, uh, for example, you mm, you used uh, si mm, simple times like on negative uh, to ensure that uh, number is non-negative. Uh, isn't it uh, be right to put, uh, for example, a set in the constructor to check it somehow? Mm, okay, so the question is generally about uh, using assertions. And there is a, of, it's a very controversial uh, subject. One way of looking at it that, that uh, I find most appealing nowadays is that they have a very well specified semantics. It's just Depending on some macro, but, um, uh, this n debug or, or not, it does two things. Either it I, you are guaranteed that it performs defensive check and uh, alerts the, the user by terminating or sometimes by other means, or it does nothing. And you should not, uh, maybe it's the best way to assign no other, uh, you know, mm, more abstract meaning to it. So you can use as a hint to check something in the code. Yeah, ju just, you know, just terminate if this happens. I, uh, I sometimes use it for expressing preconditions, but not because I, I consider it a proper tool for doing that. It's just that there is no proper tool for expressing preconditions, and we have to find substitutes. Like, assert is a suboptimal substitute for expressing preconditions. Another way is just performing an if check and throwing an exception. It's not an ideal, it's not a precondition, but we don't have preconditions, so we have to use something instead. If you, if you like using as an assertion, doesn't mean the check is gone in release mode. It means it is gone when you define some macro. You can go to release and still de define this macro. That you, you get all the defensive checks you need. But if you go with asserts, if you like them, it doesn't matter whether you, you use them in functions or in constructors or in destructors. They make sense everywhere as long as you have made this decision that you are going with asserts to, uh, to express the correctness of some statements in the code. But whether using a search for asserting cor correctness, it's a controversial issue that I, I'm not willing to <laughs> yeah, uh, it go it into. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Would you advocate uh, an approach uh, to not use defensive checks at all? There, uh, no, I I would not <laughs> I would not go as far. Well, but uh, the compromise that I find satisfactory is 
to have them hidden around the macro so that when at some point you decide you don't want them there, you can remove them. But if somebody decides it's a bad idea, you can easily put them back. Because there is one model, I think it was other uh, uh, John's presentation that I've seen that convinced me. There is a way of looking at it that you have a uh, you have two programmers uh, w w communicating, working on different parts of the program, but they miscommunicate. The one has a precondition, the other doesn't understand what the precondition is. They, they just miscommunicate. You have a problem. Uh, th throwing some exception that doesn't solve the problems. You still have bug in the in the in the program. It should be fixed rather than uh, reported at runtime. But y but when it is an exception and it goes up, you can uh, consider another person. Like you have some uh, some more educated uh, programmer that is you know assembling the whole program together. And at some higher level, he can decide. Ah, we just. We get an exception. We just shut this module. Uh, this this module was uh, written by the novices. We just shut it off, and go on uh, with the other parts of applications that are known to work correctly. So that if you can separate it into the modules, and you, the your program can live without one, it's like an add-on, which is not essential. You you have a way rather than crashing the entire program to eliminate some parts ther uh, thereof. It's not an ideal solution, but. You don't have ideal solutions in this uh, in this industry. You can uh, you only have solutions that work. So the the short answer is no. I would not. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have next question here. Do you think static uh, static asserts in your code might solve some of these problems? Like you could get compiler warnings, but um, maybe not the optimizations. Static assertions I is a good solution, provided that you can use them. Provided that something you, you check is checkable at uh, compile time. We discussed the last example wi with, uh, uh, wi with these iterators. Visual Studio solves it with, uh, visu uh, with static asserts. And yeah, it prevents uh, uh, bugs like this. It is part of a more general statement that any computation that doesn't need a, a runtime in input could, in principle, be performed at uh, compile time. And then there you have better mechanisms of reporting errors than, than exceptions. You can just alert the programmer that something is wrong and you have to fix it. So yes, wherever you, you can, you should go for static asserts or similar tools, like enable ifs. Okay, thank you. I believe we have time for one more question. Do we see any hands? Okay, I see. In the front. On the front. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about one of the thing first slides. Was probably slide number four. You mentioned there was some and uh, 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 undefined behavior on the namespace, and then and there was an variable underscore i, and I couldn't get quickly why it's undefined behavior where why it was yes and uh, this yes this this slide what 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 there is a reason why you can get it because there's uh, it's just this you know it just th this is what you read in the standard if you define a global variable with underscore it's undefined behavior which means 99% of the cases you're good with it you can go with it and the program will run but it may also mean because you you know Typically, you are also including somewhere above, you would include uh, the standard library header. And you don't know what happens there. And they reserve the possibility for uh, you know, adding whatever names in global namespace they want, uh, starting with underscore. So you may be interfering with some ideas from the standard library, which we're not aware of. But basically, it should be, it should be checked at compile time. And I think the, that the clang tidy the recent version, version that they just released does check for that. Uh, for that or, or for that, I can't remember for, for which one. Because this is something you could actually check statically. Thank you. Andre, do you have any closing remarks or are you ready to take the applause? Yeah, let's go for the applause. <laughs> Thank you, Andrzej Krzemieński.